Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Al Longoria. This is my good friend, Mandy Yates. Welcome to episode number 35 of Ask Al. And, and thanks so much for being here because obviously uh, Game of Thrones is on. And if you're watching me, um, I really appreciate that. No, I am not the Night King or Jon Snow. But, um, but yes, thank you so very much for watching this. Um, if this is your first time um, watching this show or any of my content, um, I am Al Longoria. I am a dog trainer in, in Houston, Texas. Uh, I've been training dogs and, uh, and helping families for about nine years now. We're getting close, getting close to 10, um, but really appreciate you being here tonight. If you have any dog training questions or any maybe even business questions or anything else that I can help you with, would love to, love to know what's going on with you and your dog. Um, we've got a list of prepared, some prepared questions that folks have asked during the week in a variety of ways. We kind of get these questions from social media. But um, if you have a question, uh, drop that down below and let's see if uh, I can see that we actually are live. Can you see anything there yet? Oh, well, maybe. Oh, well, I haven't gotten it. Yeah, let's see. Let's make sure that we're actually live. That's the one thing. Oh, yeah, we are, okay. Except it says 34. There we go. Well, maybe it's 34, maybe it's 35. Maybe I'll change, it's, we'll change it. Maybe it's 973, but yeah. anyway, thanks so much Thanks so much for watching again. And so, um, yeah, if you have a comment, uh, drop those down in the comment section down below. And hey, we really appreciate all you guys watching. And uh, we'll be sh I'll be sure to give as detailed of an answer as I possibly can. All right, so Mandy, if you've got questions, um, I've got answers. I've got questions. All right, what's question number one? How long, on average, is a dog's attention span? Well, it's pretty variable, actually. It is a, it's a very, very variable thing, um, your dog's attention. Um, I've seen puppies that actually have some phenomenal, phenomenal attention, and I've seen adult dogs um, that, that didn't have any attention to save their lives, at least the type of attention that, that we want is attention back on us. To put it very simply, you know, when dogs come out of the womb, the very first thing that actually gets their attention after they get cleaned is food. And so food attention is, uh, can be a pretty strong thing. If you think about being this blind and deaf puppy that just entered the world, maybe, you know, just a, a, you probably have attention that draws the puppy from where it just got cleaned to the mother and the puppy might just crawl there and that might be 20 or 30 seconds worth of attention to be able to get there. Now, I've never timed this, but I've just kind of seen enough puppy videos and I'm thinking about it right now. And 20 to 30 seconds seems a pretty good time for somebody that was, that was just born. Um, however, though, when you start talking about dog's attention, really what's going on a lot of times is there's a lot of different things that are competing for the dog's attention. You know, like I said, the dog comes out of the womb, it's blind and deaf. So no squirrels, no cats, no other dogs, the sight of humans. The only thing that the dog really has is the smell of the mother, which is really very, you know, very, very uh, uh, prominent mm -hmm. in, those, in those circumstances. Um, so yeah, you know, when the dog can singularly focus on something, then you can have quite a bit of attention. But when the brain is bombarded with voice commands, noises from other creatures, um, the movement of other things, and the dog's brain really begins to have more and more to contend with. And I think that as humans, we know this, when you put yourself into an environment and you don't have too many things, you can actually get a lot done. But when you have a lot of things uh, in the environment, lots of people talking to you, maybe a TV going on in the background, maybe a dog barking, you know, all these things, and it gets harder and harder to be able to focus. So as you cultivate attention from your dog, it becomes important, at least in the beginning, to make your, uh, make your environments very simple and begin to teach your dog the simple truths about who you are. Um, one thing that I'm constantly talking about is that we always want to teach our dogs that our voice ultimately leads to any kind of reward. And, and that makes a lot of sense, but it's actually not quite so easy to do. The, the first thing that you want to do when you're thinking about this is just to really isolate your body language. A lot of people and a lot of my clients as I'm watching you guys, when you go to talk to your dog, the first thing that you maybe do is actually move close. You lean into your dog, you move closer and you try to use that to be able to get the dog's attention. So what I tell people is just to, you know, kind of relax in this nice calm environment and just simply talk to your dog, maybe say good dog or say their name. And then after you say their name, then start moving, then start grabbing food and then start petting them. 
Um, and that's really going to help set you up to be able to get uh, a lot of attention from your dog. So, you know, attention is a very valuable thing. Now, I have Gabby and I have Fritz and Gabby and I were out at practice today and I felt that there were stretches where I would have Gabby's attention for two to three minutes and there wasn't any reward and there was a, a lot of things going on around us. So you can cultivate attention to be quite big, but in the beginning, you really want to start in simple environments um, and put your voice first and then anything meaningful for the dog right behind that. And that's a, that's a surefire way to be able to, to help you get more attention from a creature that might be challenged. So, all right, what's next? Well, next is how do you potty train a small dog? You know, it's a good question. And potty training is one of the questions that we get, we get quite a bit of. Uh, you know, the, the process that we use for potty training doesn't really, doesn't really consider the, the size of the dog. I think a lot of times when we think about potty training problems, you know, we're, we're instantly looking for a quick solution. Um, but, the, but the solution to potty training is the formation of a habit. So when you're trying to form a habit, it's not necessarily the easiest thing because we ourselves, we have to be pretty diligent at actually leading the dog to be able to form the habit that we want. So, so small dogs are difficult. Um, and I think one of the more common mistakes that people make, and this is with any breed, but with small dog in particular, is that we leave a lot of water out for them. Um, and I'm seeing that a lot with small dogs right now in the families that we're visiting, that they're constantly leaving water out. And it's, and it's, you know, it's not necessarily your fault because everything that you hear from your veterinarian and everything mm -hmm. that you hear, that you read and see on the back of the labels of the dog food is always have fresh water, you know, fresh water available for your dog. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is, is if, I, if I sat here and I drank all this water and I went back and filled it up with the pitcher for the duration of the show, I'm going to have to use the restroom quite a bit. And I'm not necessarily need to be inundated with water. So when you're thinking about your, your small dog, be real careful about leaving a lot of water out for them. It's okay for them to get a little thirsty. We're not talking about dehydration, but a little bit of thirst um, can 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 help you to be able to manage it. So just to kind of walk everybody through the process again that I use. Um, so we use uh, our dog's food to train them and then I give them water after they're done training. So they've had their food and water um, and then I crate dogs and I like to create a dog in something that's about the size of their body. Okay. Now here's where it can begin to get complicated because people sometimes put their puppies inside the crate and then the, the puppies are making a lot of noise and it's hard for the puppy to become calm in there. So there's, some, there's a training issue, but let's just say that that's not your dog. Let's just say that your dog goes into the crate, is nice and quiet because you just finished training. 20 to 30 minutes later is about the time that you want to take them out. I encourage you to, to listen to your dog, if it's not the whiny kind of dog, listen to your dog when they're in the crate and see how they do make noises because your dog will vocalize in a way that tells you that it's time to pee and it will be different than the vocalization that means they just want to come out and bite at your legs again. So, you know, listen for that, but you're going to have to pick that out over several days. So your small dog got its food and water, went into the crate 20 to 30 minutes later, you go outside. And then what I like to do, I'm like super organized with this kind of thing. I take my watch and I'll set a timer for three minutes. I set that timer for three minutes. If the dog uses the restroom, then I really, really reward the, that dog with something that it really enjoys. It doesn't have to be food. It could be a game. And then if they don't use the restroom, here is another place people make mistakes. The dog won't use the restroom and then they'll say, oh, I got a bunch of stuff to do. They'll go back in and they'll leave the dog loose. And that will really derail mm -hmm. your program really fast. I, if I give the dog three to five minutes outside to use the restroom, like three to five minutes is not a short amount of time. That's plenty of time for a dog to use the restroom. If they don't use the restroom, I have to make it their problem so they can learn. And I put them back into the crate. I put those dogs back into the crate so that way they can understand that, hey, you, you gotta, you're going to have to hold it. And then I go through the process of making them hold it again for another 20 minutes or so and then back from there. So, you know, the potty training for the dogs, it's, it's pretty much the same for any kind of breed, but small breed dogs, just make sure you're not leaving that, that water out and make sure you're not giving them freedom when they choose not to use the restroom in places that they don't want to go. Okay. Okay, next. Next is, is it better to have a male and female dog versus two females? 
Well, I can only really speak from experience, but I know a couple of stories that are just kind of fascinating here. Many years ago when I was just getting started as a dog trainer, I wasn't coaching people or doing anything like that. What ended up happening is uh, there was a, a, a lady very influential in my life. Uh, her name was Victoria Tackett. But Victoria told me that the worst fight that she ever saw was from two dogs, uh, two female dogs inside of a like, you know, she was going out, she was going out into the backyard. They had a mud room. Like I have a mud room right here, right behind this picture. Um, and she had two female dogs in the room. They got into a fight. She got pretty seriously hurt, you know, from the two females fighting. And so, um, and, and they would always kind of, after that point, they would always tell me that it's never a good idea uh, to have two female dogs together. Um, now I've had, I've had two females in my home. I've also had, well, I've had two males and a female and then two females and a male, um, in the past, I guess, you know, five years, maybe yeah, five or six years. And I'm just, I'll, I'll tell you this, when, when this question is probably one of aggression is what I'm, is kind of what I'm guessing. And so, um, I set a rule very quickly in my home and I'm going to be as clear as I possibly can to give the answer here. Um, I don't tolerate any kind of fighting inside of my home and, do and puppies that are older than four months of age, but that are generally less than two, don't get to play with other dogs. Now, those are some pretty hardcore rules, and I don't recommend those for everybody, but they work really, really well for the way that I, that I want to raise my dogs. So if two dogs were to begin to get into the beginnings of a fight in my home, um, the chances of them experiencing the things that they liked least in the world is, is an absolute. They're going to experience that. They're going to get in trouble with the thing that they like. And I get the question like, hey, what, what do they don't like? You know, it's different for every dog. You know, I, I like the remote collar. Um, other dogs, you could just throw a dirty look. Some of them you could use a spray bottle with water. I don't really like that technique, but you know, if they're gonna be in a fight, it's important to set a boundary that you are to avoid fighting any other creature inside of my home, and here's the reason why. Um, it's not about tolerance, because if you're tolerant there, the dog will push that boundary, and eventually um, it can happen, they will assert themselves. Now, a lot of dogs, a lot of dogs have great temperaments, will never, never fight another dog. Um, but more powerful breeds and even small breeds, man. Yeah, I, I guess I shouldn't have said that. Any kind of breed, you just gotta look at the temperament and see how pushy they are. So I absolutely say no to anything that might lead to a fight and every participant, everybody that participates in that gets in trouble because I'm gonna make them all avoid that circumstance. But then the other thing that I'm doing is I'm denying their ability to play with other dogs because the flip side to that coin is I will do everything in my daily habits to build the most amazing play relationships with my dogs because that in the end is gonna be the thing that gives me all the super fun stuff that I wanna be able to do with my dogs. So to answer the question, it's been my experience um, that it doesn't really matter one way, one way or another, but I would say that it's been easier for me having two females and one male versus two males and one female. And that's just, and that's just, that's my, my experience, but I can definitely see how it can be different for pe for pe other people. Okay. All right. What's next? Next question is how do I keep my dog off of the couch? You know, part of the mindset that we have here is uh, a lot of folks, and this is just the human brain in general, the human brain tends to focus on the things that, you know, the negative aspect of things. Um, you know, we're always looking out for like, hey, that, you know, like we complain as humans and, you know, we talk about, we, we talk about each other in bad ways sometimes. I'm not saying you in particular, but, you know, in general, humanity is kind of geared that way. And so keeping your dog off the couch the, the, the real answer is, is what is it that your dog should be doing? And can you imagine that in your head? And, and the reason that we don't do that sometimes is because it's harder to imagine than to do nothing. Um, and so let's say your dog jumps up and you push them off. Your dog actually wants to know where to be. And if you think about the situation, like the one that's going on in my living room right now, my couches are very, very soft and the floor is particularly hard. And it, it just looks like an obvious choice to me that the place to be would be on the softest part possible if I'm going to lounge, right? Mm -hmm. So your dog actually needs a place that, that you, you should have for them. Um, we, use, we use elevated beds. 
um, that do a fantastic job of keeping my dogs, uh, keeping my dogs healthy and comfortable. Um, but my dogs, as a privilege for good, uh, for good behaviors and good manners in my home, are also allowed up on my sofa. So if you don't want your dog on the sofa, you have to show them a place to be. It has to be at least of equal comfort value that your couch is, um, if, not, if not better. And you have to be willing to go and visit your dog on their place and make them feel wonderful. Uh, and I tell you guys all the time, it's just such a good idea that when you're trying to teach your dog how to stay, that you go sit on the floor with your bowl of food or with your treat pouch and massage, give your dog a really nice massage while they're on their bed um, and you're feeding them. It's like kind of like the wine and grapes thing as they're sitting there. So that's a really, that's a really good thing. And uh, um, anyway, I just really think that the dogs have to know where you want them to be, but then for sure, the part that you can train is teaching them like there are consequences um, for coming off when we didn't ask you to. And that's really where you're going to get reliability in that skill. Okay, what's next? Uh, what are the different components of the canine good citizen test? Yeah, that's, a good, that's, that's a good question. And I saw that, you know, I saw that question come in. Um, I'm going to pull it up here on my on my uh, on my iPad because it's actually it's actually on my website um, longoriahouse.com. If uh, for any of you guys, um, I'm looking at the website right now, and where you hit the like it depends. If you're looking on a mobile browser, if you're looking on the mobile browser, you could go uh, and uh, hit the little the little three dashes icon, and that's going to show you that's going to show you the the menu. You may also be able to see the menu. If you click on the dog training tab, underneath there, there should say uh, Crosby Canine Good Citizen Group Class. Now, I don't have any classes scheduled, uh, scheduled for the moment, um, but I will quickly go over the 10 components of the Canine Good Citizen. Okay, So uh, component number one is, uh, test number one is accepting a friendly stranger. Uh, test number two is sitting politely for petting. Test number three is appearance and grooming. Test number four is uh, out for a walk, walking on a loose lead. Uh, test number five is walking through a crowd. Test number six is the sit and down on command and staying in place. Test number seven is coming when called. Number eight is reaction to another dog. Number nine is reaction to distraction. And number 10 is, sub, is supervised separation. And what I like to tell all my clients and people that are practicing for their canine good citizen test, here's what it boils down to. Leash walking, a sit stay, a down stay, coming when called, and then the other parts where the dog can actually be handled by more than one person and can be handled. If your dog can handle those things. If you just focus on loose leash walking, sit, stay, down, stay, come, and then you can actually handle your dog, like get into the pads of their feet and put your fingers in there, get into their ears, check their gums and do things like that. Um, and you begin to practice that with your puppy at a very young age. It won't be that difficult to be able to do that. The thing that trips up a lot of people, the loose leash walking gets a ton of people and then surprisingly, supervised separation, like the dog being handed off to somebody else, and then you dis disappear for three to five minutes, that can be pretty tough for a dog. So uh, I think it's important for more, more people than just your family members, somebody outside the family, to occasionally handle your dog. And just, you know, you hand your dog off to them and then you disappear for a minute, you go inside of a store or something like that. But that's a, that's a really good thing. But those are the components of the Canine Good Citizen Test. It's not that difficult of, of a test, but you do have to put in some preparation. And my recommendation is really, really focus in on the leash walking because that's the one that, that really kind of that kind of uh, trips up people uh, the most. So let's see. Oh yeah, and just on the, on that, you know, when you're if you if you're going to take that test, if you're going to take the uh, the Canine Good Citizen test, you, you definitely want to use you, you know treats and any your, your dog's food and any toys, any kind of training collars. But as you're getting closer to the test, what my recommendation is is that you actually uh, you actually have your training tools on, and then you discipline yourself to the best of your ability to not use those training tools and get your dog to do everything and then use your rewards at the very end of it. Um, if you're still having to use your tools 
to craft the things that you want the dog to do on a regular basis, then you're probably not ready to take the test. Okay. All right, what's next? Next is, how do I stop my dog from breaking out of his crate? You know, this has been a really, really interesting one, and I've thought about it, uh, I've thought about it for some time. You know, there's really a lot of dogs, a lot of dogs that are suffering with, you know, different forms of separation anxiety, and this is really the thing that's getting dogs, uh, getting dogs to under, uh, you know, to break out. And I've seen some really, really, you know, really over-the-top ways that people do that. Now, if you're a dog trainer um, and you, let's say that you're doing a board and train and you get, you get client dogs in, um, it's a, there's a good chance that you might have, that you're going to have to deal with some of these dogs and you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to fix them. So if this is your dog, if your dog ha is breaking out of the crate, what I would recommend, um, if, you know, during your weekend or when you have your time off, if you're off for a couple of days, this is a time to really hit it pretty heavy and to learn how to get your dog not to break out of it. The premise of breaking separation anxiety really is teaching the dog how to stay in a place where they're not physically contained, but that they can actually become calm. And, and it's actually surprisingly simple if you truly assert yourself that, it, that your dog is going to have to do it. Now, yes, there are exceptions to this, but it goes back to just that play stay. So let's just, I'll go back to the crate for a second. When you're trying to teach your dog about breaking out the crate, it's not about reinforcing the crate or even buying one that's even, even tougher, like steel or aluminum where the dog can't get out. Yes, that, if you buy one of those $500 Alcatraz. steel crate, yeah, Alcatraz crates, your dog is probably not going to get out. But I have heard of, I have heard of dogs, like some very powerful Belgian Malinois and German Shepherds, that they're in there and they'll break their teeth against the metal trying to get out because that's like they're very anxious about being in there so the thing that i'll tell you there is um is to teach the dog that there are differences so if you i would leave the door completely open and we always try to to, to instill into every dog that we train that when you are inside of your crate that one it is fundamentally very comfortable so two i want you to put a very soft cushion inside of the crate do not close the door because if your dog has separation anxiety and you put a very soft cushiony crate in there, they're going to destroy it and you could find yourself at the veterinarian, you know, trying to get some of that stuff out, you know, or worse, mm -hmm. heaven forbid that. So make it really soft in there. And then, you know, it's important that when you endeavor to, to begin this process that your, your dog is also hungry. Here's something that is a little different. Um, I probably would take some of the dog's food and maybe initiate getting the dog in there and showing the dog how good it is to be in there. Um, but then the next thing that I would do is I would have a pre-prepared Kong. Um, so for those of you guys that don't know what a Kong is, it's basically, it's a rubberized dog toy that has a, a cavity in the middle and that you can actually fill, uh, fill the cavity in the middle with all sorts of stuff. What I would do is I would have a pre-prepared Kong with a lot of stuff that my dog truly enjoys and it would be frozen. So that way, once I initiated the dog going into the, into the crate with the door open over the top of the soft uh, cushion, then after a few minutes of me hand feeding the dog, then I would, have, I would give the dog the Kong so that way they could understand that it's good. Now, here's where it's going to get tricky, but you're going to have to watch. Once you stay in the room with the crate that, uh, that your dog is in, and you do need to have a leash on your dog each time your dog comes out, you need to use your leash to put your dog back in, get your dog to stay inside the crate for three to five seconds, and then begin the process of showing them again. In the beginning, it's gonna be pretty challenging because your dog is gonna fight you. Maybe not literally, but they're going to resist going back into, going back into the containment. But what you gotta do is you gotta start practicing this to break down the dog and showing that, that the place to be is inside of the containment, not outside of the containment and you know and biting and, and, bre and breaking stuff so um that's really how you're gonna that's really how you're gonna break it i've seen a lot of people be very successful that they get off at work uh, they get off from work on friday they don't go back until monday and then starting friday night through saturday and sunday they break the they break the separation anxiety just by sh by perpetually putting the dog back in over and over over the course of the weekend Yes, you should be doing some other things. You should probably walk your dog treadmill training if you can. 
definitely maybe throwing a ball, getting your dog to chase, but then keep coming back to that crate and showing the dog that you're going to have to stand there eventually and hopefully over the course of a day or so you'll be able to close the door and the dog will understand that so all right guys so uh yeah well, two more all right yeah. and, hey if it, does anybody well i haven't i guess i should open up and see if anybody's wow. asked asked any questions quiet mode turned on swipe left to reveal comments okay cool all right no comments yet yeah. well that's fine by me all right none yet all okay. right so what's next uh how do how do i keep my dog from jumping yeah, jumping is one of those things where, you know, we really have to be prepared to handle it. You know, I've, I see some families um, that actually struggle quite a bit with jumping. And one of your best friends, and we were, obviously we were just talking about it, one of your best friends to prevent jumping is actually your crate. The dogs, you know, dogs love to jump when they first see their humans um, you know, some, some of them, like what you said the other day, I asked like some of them, when they see you, they even scream yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So like you'll have a dog, you'll have a dog that gets really, really, ex really excited. And jumping is a pretty normal thing for your dog to do when they become excited. It's not necessarily bad, but it's definitely bad if it's directed at you. So having your, like if you have your excitable dog inside of a crate, when you first get home or when you first see them, the great thing that you can do that's going to minimize a lot of the jumping is as they're excited, you're gonna open the crate door and as they try to bolt out with all that extra energy, you're gonna close the door over and over until you see the dog actually, you know, calm down and take a breath, that they actually back off a little bit. So the dog backs off, the dog is actually becomes calmer. Now you can do something that will actually work for you. Take some really yummy food. Once the dog has come down, put the food to the dog's nose bring the dog out into the environment where the crate's not there and then feed the heck out of the dog when their paws are firmly seated on the ground. You know, that, that, because the crate, the great thing is obviously the crate has a ceiling and if the dog is there, it's not gonna jump and bump its head against the top of the crate. It will, contain, it will control itself. And then the door, the door can really help it. So keep opening and closing, keep opening and closing. And then once the dog comes down, and you start talking to the dog and feeding the dog, now you're really starting to, to show the dog that jumping, one, we're not gonna allow you to do a lot of it, but then two, we really love for you to have your feet on the ground. Uh, and I just think that that's a really, really great way. One thing that I see is a lot of families will put gates up and instead of crating their dog, they'll give their dog like the kitchen or something like that and there'll be a gate there, a baby gate there and a baby gate there. And sh sure enough, you come home, the dog is, uh, the dog is in that penned in area, and where's the dog? The dog is with its feet up on top of the crate, and then what do you do? You go right over to the dog, hey, good boy, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. And so when your dog is standing, you are rewarding a jump. If they're standing with their feet up and you're rewarding them, you just rewarded a jump. So think about those baby gates and use your crate use your place training and definitely use your food to reinforce your dog for keeping all of their feet down on the ground and that's a surefire way to really help you uh to get that under control all right so it looks like we got one more question mm -hmm. uh what should i look for in a boarding facility for my dogs well one and this is what i recommend to anybody that's looking for anything is does that place have good reviews? Do they have a lot of pictures showing the place? Um, do they have a social media presence where you can see the kind of dogs that you want to see, like frolicking or training or whatever kind of facility it is? But yeah, I would look at social media reviews. I would look at pictures, social media presence. How consistent are they? Um, is it a chain? I actually kind of like that in a board and train place. That is, is it a national chain because they... They probably have some standards. They have, you know, not to say that not to say that small businesses don't have standards. But if it's a national chain, especially here in Houston, the national chains that are here in Houston, those dudes, those people, they do a great job. Now, there's a lot of board people that will, you know, take your dog in into their home, and you know, I've seen people do a really good job with that. But you don't really know what you get. Are they insured? Are they bonded? Um, what kind of training do they have? Those do they people have, should have reviews do, do too. They, do, you know, those people should have reviews too. So they should, you should be able to see what the inside of their homes look like if they're going to open it up for business. So, mm -hmm. you know, just look at those things. And then for sure, you know, contact several places, contact several places. Um, 
you know, if you're looking for, for a boarding place, um, you know, a board and train, then I would definitely be looking at a place that you can see videos of the before and after of what the dogs look like. You know, there's a, you know, with Instagram and Facebook and YouTube, there's no reason why anybody that's been training for any amount of time can't show you uh, before and after of dogs that they're boarding and training. Um, but for, for board and trains, yeah, or for any kind of business, just the reviews, what, what people are saying about them, the, the amount of pictures, social media presence. Um, yeah, that's going to, I think those are going to be the same. Do you, do you have anything to add there that you I don't board. I've no, I don't. Yeah. Really do board. You, so what do you, what do you do? Do you do pet leave. sitters? You don't, you don't, you don't leave. <laughs> I like have ever. too many dogs. It's too expensive. Honestly. That's yeah, you know, like what I've done, I'm a little bit different too, guys, you know, so uh, unlike Mandy, I do leave. Um, if I, I leave, leave, someone has to stay at home. Yeah. We don't all leave as a family. That's just how we That's how it. you roll. Yeah. How, it's how you that's don't how, roll. That's how we don't roll. <laughs> that's how you don't roll, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I take my dogs with me. I have two right now, and I, I've been talking about it probably since December that I'm going to add another one. At some point, I will add another dog, but having three would definitely complicate it. And I've thought about this question. So if I'm going to leave, um, I'm either going to go buy an RV and take them with me, um, or I think I'm going to get a pet sitter. Um, but the pet sitter, they'd have to be insured and bonded. Um, they'd have to have a reputation. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to interview the heck out of you if you're watching this. Yeah. So just, just know that if, uh, if my dogs are not doing good when I come back, uh, <laughs> there will be... I took be... a dog on vacation one time thought it was a great idea and we ended up at the emergency room oh fifteen hundred dollars later because they swallowed a fish hook oh and, my you know, gosh i've decided traveling with dogs just isn't much of a vacation <laughs> for me it, was, anyway. it's, it is a lot of work i really enjoyed my time with with fritz and gabby last summer as um i think we went to waco oh, yeah. we went to we went to waco did we we were here in Houston some, went to some places in Houston that I never go, and then went down to Corpus and uh, Corpus Christi and Padre Island. And it was a really, it was a really fantastic trip. And I'm just incredibly thankful that they listen mm -hmm. and they respect the leash and that they have brains. Was that Gabby's first trip? No, Gabby, like, well, Gabby's had several trips that she's taken as part of the way that we socialize, but I never had a trip like that, like that particular one. Hey guys, I, I want to give y'all like we're it's eight thirty six. Um, I want to watch the Rockets playoff game. Mandy wants to go back home and make some more awesome stones. Um, <laughs> but I just want to give y'all an opportunity. Uh, if anybody that's watching this, uh, if anybody uh, does have a question, please feel free to drop that down below. Hey, for the for those of you guys that did watch tonight, hey, thanks so much for watching this. It, it really means the world to me that you would give me your attention. I hope that I've brought you some kind of value. Um, if I did, it would mean the world to me if you would smash that heart button. And would you consider sharing this on your wall? Um, those shares really kind of help, kind of help us to uh, to be able to let other people know about my dog training business. But it, it means so much to me that that you guys uh, have watched tonight. If you're watching after the fact and 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 you have a question uh, about your dog and you're needing some help, um, I've devoted my life uh, to giving uh, giving all my knowledge away for free. So I, there's. There's not much that I won't do to be able to help you uh, to raise a, a happy and reliable dog or whatever, through whatever problems you're going And if whatever problems you're going through, regardless of, yeah, regardless of the issue, if it's aggression, if it's, you know, if it's anything, you know, I'm always happy to help you guys. So, all right, well, I don't see any questions. I don't see any questions. Uh, Everyone's watching Game of Thrones. Yeah, everybody's watching Game of Thrones. So we're going to go watch the Rockets and then I'm going to watch Game of Thrones. Love you guys. Have a great night and we'll talk to you later. Bye.